Okay. Gentlemen, we are live. This is an exciting evening. It's the first time we've had six people in person and two people on Zoom rather than having six people on Zoom and two people in person. And Michael Goldson said he couldn't come tonight, so we would have even might have even had seven. So we're, 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 we're almost getting back to pre-COVID numbers, Michael. This is good. It's a good sign. It's a sign of good things, Ivor, right? We got to get Phil Mellish back. I don't know if Phil Mellish can be able to come at night. All right. Anyway, good evening, everyone. Good evening to those of you on Zoom. Good evening to those on Facebook Live. Good evening to those on Twitter anytime. And to those people who are here in person, thank you very much for joining me. For those who are listening, please visit her anytime for great Torah content. Always a great place to go. Okay. Ah, there's someone else over here as well. Ian. I'm not sure if that's Ian Creek or Ian Klein, but Ian is here. So tonight, we're going to see a few ideas that I saw in Pasha's Bolo. The first one is actually an idea. I spoke about this idea last night at the Shower Brochus. David Langer's daughter, Rivka, who got married to Yoda Simon. So I mentioned this idea at the Shower Brochus, but I really like the idea so much that I'd like to mention the idea again. Usually don't like to repeat, but I think this is not considered repeating. Okay, so we have over here, this is on page 856. If you're looking for the Pasha of the week, it's Pasha's Bolag, 856 in the Art School of Hamoshim. And Vaya Bolag Ben Sibba, we start off with Bolag Ben Sibba, who's the king of Moab, looks out and he sees what the Jewish people have done to the Emori, which is the nations we spoke about last week, Sichon and Og, whom they had killed. And then they were very worried because they thought that the Jewish people, they're next. You know, when you see this, I'm guessing, I don't know, I didn't live at the time. I don't think there's anybody here that lived at the time. But, you know, when people saw the German war machine and it just swallowed up France and it swallowed up Belgium and it swallowed up Austria, you're just like, and, and Poland, you're like, who's next? Who knows how quick this is going to happen? This is just going to, it's like Pac-Man. You almost feel that that's how they're moving. So they're looking out at this and they're saying, oh my goodness me, we're next. What's going to be next? Okay. So they sent a message to Bilam of Ba'ar. Bilam the son of Ba'ar from Pesara, and they sent him a message saying the following. So if you're looking at verse 5, Pesach 8, they sent messengers to Bilam the son of Ba'ar, Pesara to a place called Pesar, Asher which is by the river, Eretz Pnei to the members of his people to summon him, Lamar to say, he may behold, Am Yotzim a people has come out of Egypt, he and Akisar's Ainarts, behold, they have covered the surface of the land. And is opposite me now. That is what Bilam says. And therefore, they asked, that's what they have asked Balak to tell Bilam. And he's therefore asking, please go and curse these Jewish people. When you go further down, Bilam says, hey, listen, I can't just say yes to this. This is a difficult thing. I can't just decide this on my own. I really need to get God's input on this one. So I say, all right, so what do you need to do? He says, well, stay with me overnight. I'm going to spend the night, and God's hopefully going to come to speak to me at night and tell me what to do. If I should go with them, I shouldn't go with them. He said, okay, fine. So they spend the night. And now on page 858, when verse 9, God comes to Bilam, and he says, who are these people that are with you? Oh, top sounds like they broke the glass next door and they, they, uh, they're now starting the wedding next door. Somebody's married now. Okay. So God comes to Bilam and he says, who are these people that are with you? And Bilam says to God, Balak the ben Sipar, the king of Moab, send them to me. And now look at verse 11. He nay ha'am hayot Behold the people that are coming out of Egypt. Vayichas is in arts and that are covering the land. Atan now, go and curse them. Because perhaps I'll be able to fight against them and I'll be able to drive them out. That is what Bilam says. And God says to Bilam, He says, Don't go with them. You're not allowed to curse the nation because they are blessed. That is the conversation that goes on between God and Bilam. Now, there is a subtle difference, and yet there's what to be tremendous to be seen from this. From the following, if you go back to verse five, we say "hine am yotza mimitzrayim." The word yotza is in which tense? For those of you who are uh, grammarians, or how is it? Behold, a people has come out. So you can even look at it in the uh, "has come out" would mean in what? It's a past tense, okay? Whereas if you're looking at the verse in verse eleven, 
Hine ha'om hayotze mimitzrayim. Behold the nation, not asher yotze, but yotze. Yotze actually is in which tense? Present tense. So is it? Is it present tense? Or is it past tense? Are they coming out now? They're not coming out now. They have come out in the past. Yet there seems to be a difference between the way Bilam is phrasing this and between the way Balak is phrasing this. So wherein lies the difference and what are they trying to say? Okay? So here comes a very important point that's brought out by Rav Moshe Weinstein about this. Balak misunderstood the Jewish people. And I think we'll talk about this Sort of, I guess, maybe let's try to put this into context. So, for example, you look at Britain 2020, 2022, and you see a country that hopefully, by now, again, I'm saying hopefully, I'm sure people will disagree with it, has found a way to give rights to everyone. You know, people of color have rights. People who are Jewish have rights. Pardon? As well, they also have rights. Everybody's got rights, okay? But let's go back to 300 years ago. We were selling people around. Nobody had rights. If I wanted to sell you, I could sell you. If I wanted to sell you, I could sell you. I could sell him, right? People were just traded as a commodity. So many of you might know that a few months, and I can't remember how long, how long ago was that whole story when they took the statue of the stra- slave trader and chucked it in the river? It's about a year ago. It was part of the Black Lives Matter Pardon? It's about 12 months ago. Yeah? Now, there is that conversation to be had over there. On the one hand, you say, this is a man that might have done something for this country, might have helped build up this country. On the other hand, let's call a spade a spade. Not everything he did was honest and forthright. And not everybody was treated with kid gloves by this man. And people were sold as commodities and traded. Certainly this wasn't. And so it's a very weird paradox that you live in because on the one hand, this is part of our history. And on the other hand, it's part of a history we want to forget. Nobody wants to say, oh yes, we were a slave training nation. No, no, we were a slave training nation. We don't talk about that. Nobody says Britain was a slave training nation. Today, we speak about Britain as a free country. We speak about Britain as a democracy, you know, depending on what you see now going on in parliament and whether you think that is democratic or not, and whether we're going to have a good leader of the conservative party or not. Forgetting about all of that. But in general, we look at this country as a democracy. Same is probably true for America. The same is true for France. Many of the great democracies of today don't like to be reminded that, hey, it's not so long ago in history that you guys weren't really nice. When Britain had an empire, they weren't really the nicest people. To have an empire wasn't mean to have an empire. When you go and have an empire, you go from country to country and just literally take them over and say, now I run here. But where are you from? You're from Britain. This is like the middle of Africa. This is the middle of Asia. What are you doing here? Says, yeah, why does Britain suddenly own India? just because they decided they wanted to own the Indians, so they owned India, right? So how do you get the Indians? You're just watching now what's going on with Russia and with Ukraine. Ukrainians don't really want to be run over by the Russians. So how would the Russians be able to take the Ukrainians? Just send the army in as hard as you can and just blitz everyone out. They are putting up a pretty strong fight, but my guess is that in the olden days, Everyone tried to put up a strong fight against the British. Nobody really wanted the British in their country either. Nobody wanted the British to, to have an empire. I don't think the Indians were saying, they're saying like, hey, Britain, come on in. We can't run our own country. How about you come and run it for us? No, I'm sure they don't. And the British came in and the British came in really hard and tough and rough and roughed up the Indians until they took over India. And they told, you know, Africa was split up amongst all sorts of different European countries. None of these countries had their own rights. But we don't talk about that. And if you were to call Britain a slave trading nation, people would be like, how do you talk like that about our country? We're not a country of slave traders. We're a free democracy. You're like, yeah, but not so long ago you were. Really not such a long time ago. But we've tried to forget our past. And so Bullock says, look, here's a nation that were slaves. And they came out from being slaves. And people that were slaves that finally came out were emancipated and came out from being slaves. One of the first things that they want to do is what they want to do. Put that in the past. Yeah? Nobody wants to remember that. 
And we say, where did you come from? Oh, I used to be a slave and I've just been freed two years ago. Nobody says that. That's maybe nowadays where we've become very into like voicing our opinions and telling people about our struggles. We might actually say that, but most people wouldn't want to say, oh, I used to be a slave until two years ago. And thank God I got emancipated two years ago. Thank God. No, people say, who are you? You just tell people your name. You shut up about the fact that you used to be a slave because that's not a great part of your past. That's not something you want to be sharing with anybody. And so therefore, Balak says to himself, the Jewish people were slaves. They came out of Egypt, but that's in their past. They've given up on that part of the past. They're not actually interested in discussing that part anymore. And Bilaam says, you got it all wrong. What makes the Jewish people into the Jewish people is that they are a nation that is now coming out of Egypt. We as Jewish people remember the exodus from Egypt every single day, at least twice, at least twice. Once at Shachris and once at Marif. Because by Mincha, we don't say the Shema. So by Mincha, we don't mention coming out of Egypt. It's a good question. So by Shachris, we say, by Yomer, the, uh, the third paragraph of the Shema, when we speak about the Tzitzis, Laman Tizgur, you should, Ani Hashem again, I am Hashem, your God. Asher Hotseisi, it's Hamer, it's time that took you out of the land of Egypt. Leo Sachem, that came to become your God. Ani Hashem, I am Hashem, your God. We remember every single day, at least twice, that we came out of Egypt. Shabbos reminds us that we came out of Egypt. Tefillin reminds us that we came out of Egypt. Mezuzah reminds us. There's so many reminders. Nachmanadi speaks about this. Ramban speaks about this. Basha's bow. That the exodus from Egypt is one of the cornerstones of our faith. And so we always keep on coming back to that. We don't forget about that. Because we don't want to say, oh yeah, we, you know, we're a nation that always came from free people. No, we acknowledge we were a slave nation. And we were taken out by God with great miracles and became who we became from being that slave nation. We could never forget that. We could never ignore that. It's made us who we, it's made Absolutely, it's made us who we are. And because it's made us who we are, we don't ignore that. This is what made us as the Jewish people. The Jewish people had to go down to Egypt for whatever reason. That's not part of the year, But they had to go down to Egypt. And they had to be brought out of Egypt afterwards. That was all part of the Jewish destiny. And Bilam realized that this is part of the Jewish destiny. And therefore, if Bilam says that they have come out in the past from Egypt, but doesn't really acknowledge that they still consider themselves now at this moment, having been come out of Egypt then he's lost the plot on what the Jewish story is really all about. The Jewish story is not only about having come out of Egypt in the past. It is about always living with that. And there's a famous story. It's a story I've told before, but I, I love this story. There's a famous story of a famous terrorist who was in one of the Israeli prisons in 1981 or 1982. You can look it up. I can't remember who it is, but if you look it up online, you'll find exactly who the terrorist was. No, 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 I'm not talking about a Jewish terrorist. It was an Arab terrorist at this point. But what happened was he's sitting in his cell and it's Pesach and this jail guard, the Jewish jail guard is sitting there eating a shawarma, a lafa with a shawarma. And the guy looks at him and he says, hey, it's Pesach. It's Passover. You can't eat a lafa with a shawarma. That's not Pesach Dik. That's Chametz. And the Jewish jail guard looks at me and goes, well, what has it got to do with me? Why are you driving me crazy? Why are you telling me what I can eat and what I can't eat? Forget it. You just leave me alone. Get out of here. All right. So, says the terrorist at the time in prison, he says, that night I spent the whole night awake thinking about that conversation. And I changed my entire view about the battle against the Jews. I thought we didn't stand a chance. And I changed my mind and I realized we stand a very good chance. Because a nation without a past is a nation without a future. And if the Jewish people give up on their past, then they really have nothing that draws them to the land of Israel. As a Jewish people, if we want to say, this is our land, well, what's your claim to this land? So to say, well, the UN gave it to us, not a great claim. 
to say that this is our ancestral land, that the Jewish people lived here for 2,000 years before the Muslims even came onto the scene, because they only joined us in about 650 after the Common Era, and we lived in Israel from at least 1,500 before the Common Era. We were there about 2,000 years before they even showed up. You showed up very late into this party, 2,000 years later. So we say, you know, this is our ancestral land. He says, well, you also, it was our ancestral land at one point or another also. So we say, okay, it was our ancestral, our, either, our ancestral land before it was yours. So we had it first, and it's been given to us by the UN, so we had it last also. So this is what we do. Oh, you can get lots of debates and arguments. Not for tonight's share on that one. However, what ends up happening is you have a people that if you were to look nowadays at young Israelis, there are so many what's called Yordim. There's people that make Aliyah. Aliyah means they go up, they move from their diaspora to Israel. Yerida means the opposite. They move from Israel into the diaspora. There are thousands Tens of thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands of Israelis around the world. Many of them, there are actually there's huge communities of them in London. There's a very large Israeli community in London. There's a very large Israeli community in Los Angeles and near Silicon Valley, et cetera, et cetera, because they're very, very good at high tech. But a lot of Israelis are like, why would I live in Israel? Small flats, hot weather, everything. I could move to America. I could move to the sacred, blessed land. The land of meat and money. Why would I want to live in this small little Israel that's constantly under attack when I can live in California that doesn't have any attacks? Well, unless somebody comes in shooting in your, in your supermarket in your high school. But in general, there's no attacks there. And there's so many people that have left Israel and moved there. So why would you move? Because Israel is meaningless to me. Because I don't have a past. I don't have a past connection to Israel. So this is where I grew up. All right. So I grew up here. So I'm not allowed to move. There plenty of people that move around. We've all, I've moved around probably four or five times in my life. Okay. Yeah. And then I feel like almost like a bit of a chameleon. You move somewhere else and you start again. You move somewhere else and you start again. You have to blend in again and again and again. But you can do it. Many people have moved around. We're not rooted to where we grew up. Yeah. So Israel is like, I'm not rooted to Israel. I can move away. But that's only because they don't feel a connection, a deep religious connection to Israel. So you say, I don't have to be here. So why am I here? So let me move. And that's what Bilam is saying. The Jewish people depend on Yotzei Mimitzayim. The Jewish people depend on the reality that they realize I am someone that has a past and that past has a connection to the exodus of Egypt. Okay? That's the first idea. Now, we move on to the next idea, which we spoke about the verse over here already partially. 858. We're on page 858 and the same verse that we said before. So, Bilam says, there's a nation that's come out of Egypt. They're covering up the entire land. And Balak has asked me, please, to go and to curse them because... Perhaps I'll be able to fight against them and I'll be able to get rid of them. And God says to Bilam, we read this verse already, verse 12. God says to Bilam, do not go with them. Do not curse this nation because they are blessed. Okay? What would you understand from that sentence? I would understand from that sentence that's a pretty unequivocal message from God to say to Bilam, hey, dude, no, you're not going to do this. What does Bilam understand from this? So listen to the following. Verse 13. Bilam, Aboka, Bilam gets up in the morning by and he says to the ministers of Balak, go back to your land. Because God has not given me permission to go with you. Says Rashi, what does that mean? God has not allowed me to go with you. So Rashi says, what do you mean God has not allowed me to go with you? God has not allowed me to go, period. It has nothing to do with you or anybody else. God has not allowed me to go. Says Rashi, the reason he says he's not allowed me to go with you is because he was trying to hint to them. You guys are not high profile enough. God's like, what? You sent me some kind of ministerial aid to call me 
You think that's what's honorable for a man of my stature? I'm a big guy. You want me to come? You don't just send me an Uber. You bring a guy with a driver, with a nice car that comes out, a chauffeur driven limousine, and says, sir, your car is here. And he brings me out and opens the door for me. He's not like, eh, your Uber is here. That's, that's not, you know, that's not honorable. And so Bilam says to him, listen, that's not what God wants. God does not want for you, for me to go with you guys. And they understood it. So they got back to Balak and they said to Balak, listen, Bilam says to us, we are not important enough. And Balak says, so if you look further down in verse 15, by Yosef or Balak, Balak went, Shalach, sorry, man, he continued and he sent another set of officers, Rabim and Ichpadim more and so that means more numerous and more honorable than these original people. So you have over here Bilam saying, Hey, this is not up for me. This is not honorable enough for me. I'm not willing to come. And what happens is Balak gets a message, and Balak says, Okay, you know what? I'll send a new set of messengers. And he sends much more honorable messengers. And God says, And you know what? You want to go? Go. Okay. So the question that Rav Chaim Shmulem, it's one of the, the Mira Shishiva who was also for a while the Mashgiach and the Mir Yeshiva. That means he had two positions. The Rosh Yeshiva is the one that says the Shir on the Gemara. The Mashgiach is the one that speaks about the ethics lessons within the Yeshiva. And for a while, they didn't have a Mashgiach. They didn't have somebody who was in charge of the ethical part of the Yeshiva. So the Rosh Yeshiva took over the ethical part of the Yeshiva also. Oftentimes, they split roles. Okay, that's not because Rosh Yeshiva is not an ethical person, but they usually have two different roles. Rav Chaim Shmulevitz was actually famous for being a Rosh Yeshiva, for being a tremendous, tremendous Torah scholar. However, one of the only svarim that remains from him is a sefer called the Sichos Musa, which were his Musa discourses, his uh, discourses on character improvement. And so within that discourse, he discusses the question that we're speaking about over here. And he says the following. How does it happen that when God says, don't go with them because they're a blessed nation, I'm not allowing you to curse these people. It's a pretty unequivocal message. God said nothing about the messengers. Is there anything in God's sentence over here that seems to imply that I'm not happy that these messengers aren't good enough for you? By your Malachim and Bilam, God says to Bilam, Lo do not go with them. Lo Sarasam, do not curse the people. Keep our because they are blessed. End of story. No mention of honor. No mention that these guys aren't good enough for you. And Bilam, through his mangled head, hears, these guys aren't good enough for you. You need better people. That's not what I said. You know, have you ever had people misunderstand what you said? You say A, and they totally understood there's something else. I have it all the time. They're called wives. No, just kidding. <laughs> you know, that there is there is a, a, a real difference. I think we both speak English very, very differently. You know, they speak femalese and I speak malese. That's a different dialect of English. A very, very, do you know what I'm talking about, Michael? Yes. They, they speak a very, very different dialect of English. It's weird that we actually sound the same, but speak totally different languages, right? But here you got Bilam is, Bilam's hearing God say A, and he comes back and he's giving a message saying B. So why is he giving a different message to what he said? So what Rav Chaim Shmulevit says is that you have certain people that have their mind set in a certain way. And because that is the way their mind perceives the world, everything they hear is seen through that lens, okay? So if my lens says, I am the greatest, I'm God's gift to humanity, then anything that happens around me needs to be seen through the lens of, I'm the greatest, and I'm God's gift to humanity. So it's either, yes, this is a confirmation that I'm the greatest and I'm God's gift to humanity, or this goes against the fact that I'm God's gift to humanity and must be wrong. Because I can't be wrong. I'm still God's gift to humanity. It's just that this conversation seems to somehow not dovetail with that. Something wrong over here. Okay? And so we have... Bilam sees the world through his own lens. And his own lens is the following. If you have a look in Pirkei Avos, 
in the ethics of our fathers. You will find a Mishnah there that we read about in last week's Parak and Parak Hey. And in that Mishnah, it says the following. This is chapter five, Mishnah 22, according to Art School. Some count it differently, but we're just going to say, if you're looking in Art School City, you'll find on page 578. So he says the following. Call me Shiyesh Biyot Shosh Avraham Halalu. Whoever has these three traits is the Talmud of Avraham Avinu, is a student of Abraham. And whoever is learning three other traits, he is a, a student of Bilam. So what makes a student of Avraham Avinu? Famous Mishnah. Ayin Tova, a good eye. Ruach Nemucha, a low spirit. Benefesh Shavala, and a meek soul. Those are people that Tamir Shavram Avinu. Ein Ra, a bad eye, a way of looking at people negatively. Ruach Givoa, arrogance, the Nevesh Rechava, and greed. Those make a Talmud of Bilam Harasha. What's the difference between the Talmud of Avram Avinu and Bilam Harasha? So it tells you what the difference is. So you have over here the three main characteristics of Bilam. And it's important to note this because, says Rav Chaim Shmulevitz, if that is what makes up a student of Bilam, that means this was really Bilam's entire course. Absolutely. Absolutely. These are characteristics that, that show that you have, a, you know, the HR has taken hold of you. Okay. So what you have over here is Bilam Arasha is taking on these characteristics, but not only is he taking on these characteristics, he's actually made it his life's work because he speaks over here. Anybody who has these three characteristics is a student of Bilam Arasha. He says, so a student means that this is something that he's teaching. So do you think he's teaching people, gentlemen, we must be arrogant. Yes, we will be arrogant. Gentlemen, greed is the way to go. Yes, greed is the way to go. He, he couldn't be teaching that. I mean, if that anybody stood up and started teaching that, no matter which university you went to, no matter which country that was being taught in, and no matter which college that was in, everybody would be like, goodbye to that one. That professor is crazy. So he said, so what Rav Chaim Shmulevit says, and this is very interesting, he says that you can sometimes teach these same things and just give them different names, right? So some people will say greed, and some people will say capitalism, right? Now, that's not to say I'm not a capitalist. I am a capitalist, right? I'm not a communist, don't get me wrong, right? But capitalism does teach people you're in it for yourself. Everybody's in it for themselves. Get the most that you can. That's what it is. Nobody's going to bail you out. The fact that this government has a bit of a socialist view as well and is so generous on benefits is really a, an anathema. It's really the opposite to the fact that there's a capitalist country. In many countries, it's like, look, fend for yourself. I don't have any money. So what, what do you want me to do? You want me as the government to start feeding you? You want me as the government to start paying for your housing? It's not my problem. It's not my fault. You go... And you work harder and make a bit more money. Don't expect me, the taxpayer, to pay for you to sit in the pub. Right? That's capitalism. Socialism says, you know what? We're all going to help each other. We're all going to work together. You know, you got, you got the different sides of this argument. But if you think about it, on the one hand, capitalism is an important thing because we all need to sort of look out for ourselves. But if you take capitalism to the nth degree, you end up with a horrible society. You end up with a society that's not willing to help anybody else because I'm in it for me and you're in it for you and he's in it for him and everybody's in it for themselves. Don't come to me and ask me for money for your stuff. Are you working? No, so why should I give you anything? You're working? Yeah, you make enough money? Good for you. See, you're doing the responsible thing and you're doing the irresponsible thing. And that's why you don't have any money. That's why he's got money. That's what capitalism says. I don't have to care for you. I have to take care of you. Who do you think you are anyway? That's the wrong way of looking at life. That's the wrong way of looking at things. Whereas we could say, look, we can be a capitalist society. 
We don't have to lose ourselves entirely. And ch being charitable is part of who we are. That means if you have more money, God has given you some of somebody else's money into your hand to be able to help others. Why didn't he just put it directly into, in that person's hand? Because I'm expecting you to do the job of feeding the poor. So it's because you don't need a million pounds. What are you going to do with a million pounds? Oh, lots of stuff. You buy yourself the nicest car and the nicest house. What about the guy next door that doesn't have any food to eat? Let him work. No. Some of that million pounds that's been given to you has been given to you to share with him. So maybe your house will be worth 50 grand less, but that guy will be able to eat supper. Right? So that's where God looks at. That's where we look at it. So he says, Bilam didn't necessarily teach these things from a perspective of, gentlemen, we're all going to be greedy. You just give it a social name. And suddenly when you give it a socialist name, it becomes, or not a socialist name, but you give it an ism, it becomes an ism like capitalism. It can become absolutely acceptable, right? The negative view, we might call it cynicism even, but you look out today, the media certainly has that view. We don't look at people in a positive sense. When something goes wrong, then there's nobody stands up in the media and says, you know what? Maybe we can give this person the benefit of the doubt. Maybe it wasn't as difficult as it seemed. Or maybe he didn't do something wrong and maybe we're just getting the wrong end of the stick. No. Who gives people the benefit of the doubt nowadays in the media? We find something, some kind of half-baked story, some half-read email, leaked email, in middle of a conversation. We just cut out two sentences. And then we just slam down on the person. We say, and that is in the name of truth. It's in the name of justice. People deserve to know. Why do people deserve to know? Right? Now. The truth oh, the truth gets twisted very, very badly. That's what the media is there to do. They twist the truth. The media sometimes tells the truth, but that's few and far in between. Uh, quite often they lie. Right? They and how is it that if you go into the shop tomorrow and pull out, there are 10 newspapers over there, and you pull out the 10 newspapers and you read the same story, you get three different stories there. One story says Boris Johnson is the worst thing that ever happened to this country and he should be fired and he's absolutely the worst thing. One says, look, he did a good job, but... And one says, what a shame that the man is leaving for being prime minister and he, you know, he deserved to remain. And why is everybody so against him? Is the same story. Every newspaper has their bias. I remember my sister told me she used to work for a newspaper. She was, in a, she was a reporter for the Jerusalem Post for a very short time in Jerusalem. And she said she was sent to write a story about uh, American yeshiva bachrim being sent to Israel. And the slant on the story was that they felt parents in America were being irresponsible and basically saying, look, I got a kid that I don't know what to do with. I'm shifting him off to Israel to see maybe he'll improve over there. But that's an irresponsible thing to do because really if you wanted to take care of your kid, you'd keep him nearby instead of shifting off 6,000 miles away to see with a whole bunch of money to see that maybe in a country on his own at 18, he's going to straighten out. How do you straighten a kid out by sending him 6,000 miles away and sticking thousands of dollars in his, in his hand? Why don't you expect these guys to be going to Ben Yehuda Street every night and getting drunk? Okay, so that was the slant that they thought it was going to take. And my sister went around and she interviewed different yeshivas and she spoke to boys and she spoke to girls and she spoke to rabbis and she spoke to female teachers and seminaries. And she wrote the piece and she sent it back to the Jerusalem Post and they had to read through it and they said, thank you very much. And they binned it. Do you know why they binned it? That's not what they wanted to report on. They didn't want to report on the fact that actually parents were being very sensible. Now, our parents are not being sensible. I'm not saying that every parent who's sending their child to Israel is being sensible. Some parents are really not being sensible in sending their kids away and giving them all this money and hoping that they'll make good choices. Because if they understood that who their kids were, they'd know their kids would make horrible choices. And the fact that they're 6,000 miles away with tons of money in their pockets just makes them make worse choices, not better choices. But that's not the overwhelming majority. But the newspaper didn't like what the final research showed. So instead of printing the truth, what do they do? They printed nothing. Because we don't want to tell people the truth. We want to tell people our version of the truth. And if the facts 
don't seem to dovetail with our version of the truth, we will just very conveniently not discuss it. Right? You'll find in America, there's a whole, I mean, there's a whole argument that goes on over there about Biden, where you have the Republicans and the conservatives who are so anti-Biden, every time the man makes a mistake, they're blowing the thing up everywhere. And you have the other side, for example, that are like, come on, he's the president. Let's not discuss it. Let's not drag down the president of the United States. Let's not make him look bad. So what, what's going on? He is or he isn't? I was just listening to a podcast today. So they actually played a clip of Biden reading what the teleprompter said. You know, it says, this country is in a great trajectory. Repeat that sentence. You know, that's what he read. Yeah. Now, that's, that's just bad, right? When you're a politician and you're reading the teleprompter and you read, repeat that sentence. Yeah. So now some will say, oh, that means Biden is some kind of like senile buffoon. Okay. And the others will say, look, it happens. Right. Where is the truth? I don't know. But each one of the news outlets wants to sell their version of the story. So one of them wants to keep Biden and want to give him legitimacy. So what are they going to do? They'll ignore it. Yeah, so Biden, they're not saying Biden didn't read that sentence, repeat that sentence. But that's not newsworthy for us. Let's keep shtum about it. Let's just shut up about it. And no one will have to know about it. Whereas... Pardon? Could be, could be. But, you know, but that's what one side says. The other side says, hey, wait a second. This guy made that kind of error. If he can't even read a teleprompter, how can he run the most powerful country in the world? Right? He can end up pressing the button going like, oh, whoops, that was the wrong button. I was trying to make a phone call. Yeah? <laughs> yeah. But that's, that, yeah, that's the argument. What I'm trying to say is that we have over here, nowadays, you look out in our world, we have... Talmidim of Bilam Russia everywhere. We have people that have an Ayn Ra that look things the wrong way and teaching people to look at things the wrong way and there's a negativity. We have people that are teaching them about having tremendous greed, always having a certain amount of arrogance with them. You always feel I'm right, et cetera, et cetera. There's all that in there, but it's been given a fancy new name. So Bilam didn't teach, hey guys, let's be greedy. You just give it a very fancy educated way of sounding and then you can you can teach people about that and once you see the world through those eyes what will end up happening is everything that happens to you gets seen through your own perspective through your own lens so when you wear rose tinted glasses everything looks rosy when you wear glasses that are dark you're like why is it so dark in here it's not take off the glasses right your glasses will decide what reality will look like. Your eyes will decide what reality looks like. Bilam has a warped sense of reality. And people with a warped sense of reality hear A and understand B. So Bilam hears, do not go with them. Do not curse the people. Oh, he obviously meant to say to me, because these people aren't honorable enough. A guy like you, Somebody is as important to you. They sent these lowly servants to pick you up. Who do they think they are? Why, why are they treating you like some kind of second-rate slave? What's wrong with them? Come on, send a proper contingent, and I'll consider it. But until you do that, no way. And that's what's going on over here. Bilam sees the world, says Reb Chaim Shmulevitz, through his own eyes, through his own warped sense of reality. And when you have a warped sense of reality, with it comes, everything that happens around you gets warped. Because when you look at things through a crooked lens, everything looks crooked. And so that's what happens to Bilam. And that's why Bilam messes up over here. So those are the ideas I want to share with you tonight. We had two more ideas, but we didn't get to finish those. Thank you very much, guys, for joining me here tonight. It's been an absolute pleasure to have so many people here in the base managers. Hopefully we'll grow this even further. Thank you to those who joined us on Facebook Live and on Zoom. Thanks, Elliot and Maureen. As well, we didn't say hello and to Ian. And thank you to those on Twitter anytime. If you want to get in touch, David Eisenberg at gmail.com. Look forward to Mitzvah Shem coming together again next week. Yeah. Thanks, Bobby. Yeah.